So Pastor Andrew and I were talking about this series in Haggai a couple weeks ago. And he asked me an odd question. He said, do you like Turkish delight? To which I was like, I don't know. I, I mean, I think when I was a kid, I remember in school we had Turkish delight. We were reading, you know, probably Chronicles of Narnia or something like that. But it was probably more like Jello uh, with powdered sugar all over. I think that was, in, I mean, that's pretty tasty, right? Uh, but that's not the real Turkish delight. I don't know if you guys have ever had the real Turkish delight. Uh, but I don't know, according to Pastor Andrew, he has. He said, I'm not missing much. Like, it's not that good. Does anybody disagree with that? No? Nobody's had it? Okay. Well, we'll see. You just have to go with it. Well, the deal is that the illustration he shared was perfect for our study in Haggai. Do you remember the Chronicles of Narnia? When Edmund, the younger brother of the four, uh, goes through the magical wardrobe uh, into Narnia, and he's going after Lucy, the youngest girl, right? She's wandered in, and she's just enjoying the magic of it all. And Edmund kind of goes in, like a little curious. And he's on a mission, though, because he's going, where did Lucy go? And he's trying to find her. That's the one reason that he goes through the wardrobe is to catch up with Lucy. But he doesn't find her right away. In fact, he finds someone else, or maybe someone else finds him. It was the white witch. You remember the story? The evil queen who intersects Edmund on his way to find Lucy and offers him the delectable treat of Turkish delight. And this was the moment when something distracted Edmund, something other than the one thing he set out to do, started to look more appealing to him. This is what C.S. Lewis said when he writes in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. He said, the queen knew, though Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight. And anyone who had once tasted it and would want more, uh, had once tasted it would want more and more of it. And would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it till they killed themselves. Enchanted Turkish delight. This is the predicament Edmund is in. But it's also the predicament Israel was in, in the Old Testament book of Haggai. Israel had returned from exile, this time of discipline from God when he removed them from the promised land. The Babylonians conquered them, took them back to Babylon, but then God in his grace and mercy brings the people back to the promised land and he gives them one instruction. He says, rebuild the temple. It's the sign of restored relationship and covenant with God. Rebuild the temple. And so the people come back excitedly and they lay the foundation of the temple, but then 16 years go by without anyone picking up a hammer, so to speak. Nothing happens because things other than the one thing they set out to do began to distract them. All of a sudden, some other things looked more appealing than the one thing that they got instructed to do. Just like Edmund being distracted by Turkish delight. Which, by the way, uh, Haggai steps in as God's prophet to warn the people about delighting in anything other than God, about delighting in things that would never truly satisfy like Turkish delight, things that actually would ultimately destroy them. This is the message of Haggai. It can kind of be wrapped up in actually one statement. From about 1,600 years ago, a guy named Augustine uh, said this. He said, he said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. This is sort of the message of Haggai, all wrapped up into one simple statement. And as you navigate to Haggai, which I hope you are doing in your Bible, open it up to Haggai or maybe on your phone or device, if you can get there, I want you to see it. Uh, in fact, as you navigate there, I'm going to just tell you how the story is playing out, remind you where we've been in the last two weeks, because we're wrapping up today with Haggai in chapter 2, the end of the book. So here's how it's been playing out. The first message of Haggai from chapter 1 was all about uh, warning against misplaced priorities. It was a rebuke. You know, like when I'm going down the road uh, and I just go into autopilot and I got my family in the car and we're supposed to be going out to eat, but I'm going to work. And, I just, and then Jill goes, hey, where are you going? Like that's a rebuke, right? Where she's like, hey, you're going the wrong way. Get it in your head. Get back going on the right way, okay? So they get this rebuke, uh, this warning against misplaced priorities, uh, that the people were squandering the blessing of God by not keeping God first in all things. 
Uh, and that was evidenced, right, like we said, by how they had ignored the task of building the temple for 16 years. Uh, so then what happens in Haggai, the end of chapter 1, the people repent. This is kind of one of the rare instances in the Bible where God rebukes his people and they actually turn to him in repentance. And so they repent and they kind of pick up the work of the temple again. And they start to do some things, but things aren't going the way they thought they would go. The work really isn't amounting to much. And so the second message of God through the prophet Haggai to the people is a word of encouragement. It's a word that, hey, things may not be looking like you thought they were going to look. You started the work. I'm going to provide financially for the work, but I'm also going to ensure that the work you do on this temple has meaning and purpose. Like it's going to be meaningful for the here and now, but also because it's a prophetic book, it's going to be meaningful for the future not just the near future or the far future, but the very, very far future, right? All the way into eternity, it's going to have meaning. And now we get today to the final message of God through the prophet Haggai. And here's the message. This is what we're going to learn today. Even though the people didn't deserve it, God intended to bless them. Even though they didn't deserve it, God intended to bless them. So Haggai starts this final message in chapter 2, verse 10 with the undiluted reality. Undiluted reality. Now, I want you to think about this because a prophet is not a fortune teller. That's sort of a misunderstanding about prophecy in the Bible. A lot of people think, well, it's just telling the future. It's like a fortune teller, but that's not what a prophet is. A prophet is a truth teller. A prophet relays the words of God to the people. It's usually in form of a rebuke, but sometimes it's just in a, it's just in a form of telling them who God is and what God is like. We're going to see both of those today, but he's a truth teller. It's like the brutal honesty of a close friend. Do you have a friend who will tell you that you have lettuce in your teeth? That's that friend, right? This is who Haggai is. Maybe you have a friend, and I hope you do, who might even be willing to say something to you like, hey, that relationship you're in is toxic. Like, that doesn't necessarily feel good, but you're glad to have that friend. This is what a prophet is doing. This is what Haggai is doing. He, he's not mincing words. He's not softening the word of God, but he's delivering God's message to the people in a way that they can understand. So let's look at it. Uh, the undiluted reality, right? The, the brutal honesty of the prophet in uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And let's just take two chunks to see how he, how he does this. 10 through 14 and then 15 through 19, okay? Let's start through 10 through 14. Uh, it says, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of armies says. Ask the priests for a ruling. If a man is carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and it touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai asks, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priests answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me. This is the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands, even what they offer there is defiled. Okay, now these verses may seem strange to you because we're not totally in the world they're in. You're going like, he's wrapping meat up in his garments? Is this like sticking meat in his pockets? Like what's going on here? Who is this? What's happening, okay? And, and why are they talking about corpses and defilement? So here's what I, I just want to wrap this together in kind of a simple application that I think Haggai is trying to make. Here's the point he's trying to make. He's asking, how does a person become holy? How does a person become holy? Is it by proximity to holy things? The answer is no, emphatically. In fact, he actually likens the people more to corpses, dead bodies who were defiled. And he says, you're like corpses who are spiritually dead. This is what Haggai was confronting is the reality that no amount of religious activity can revive people from spiritual death. I mean, this is true. This is probably 1,500 years ago at this point. This is still true in our day. 
that people confuse how God works. I mean, it's so prevalent in our culture that people think, if I just do enough good things, God will be pleased with me. If I could just do enough religious activity, then at some point I'll cross the line into God being happy with me. And until then, he just won't be. But where's the line? When does that happen? And Haggai is here to say, and I'm here to repeat it for you today, that no amount of religious activity can revive the spiritually dead. And that is who people are without God. So the people had repented, as the story goes, uh, from this original misplaced priority. Uh, they had been ignoring God's temple, but they started work on the temple. You remember that? So they're doing something, right? They're putting their hands to work. They're actually trying to figure something out. Uh, but God is using Haggai here to point to a much deeper reality. You kind of want to defend the people a little bit. Like, well, at least they're doing something now. But here God speaks to the people and he goes, that's fine. But I'm more concerned about something else. God was more concerned with who the people were becoming in him than what the people were doing for him. This is who God is. I mean, yeah, the temple was a holy place, right? Set apart for a holy purpose. It was the sign of restored uh, covenant and relationship with God. It, it was an anticipation of the ultimate redemption that was to come. But God was more interested in having a holy people than a holy place. A holy people who were set apart to be an example to the world of the anticipation of ultimate redemption that God would bring when he restores all things to himself. God cared more about their hearts than their hands. They had to get it in the right order, okay? Even though they started doing the work for him, God cared more about their heart toward him. This is who God is, and this is the reality. This is what Haggai is revealing to us, that you can have the outward appearance of holiness, yet be spiritually dead on the inside. Jesus would even talk about this. He, he would talk about 500 years later after this, he would talk about the Pharisees, this group of people who had the Old Testament practically memorized. I mean, they were the ones answering the spiritual questions like the priests had to do here. The Pharisees were those people in Jesus' time, but Jesus said that those people, those Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs, like a grave that actually was kind of pretty on the outside, that it kept up appearances on the outside, but on the inside was only death. Even later, the Apostle Paul would write to a young pastor named Timothy, and uh, he would write about people and, and just how people tend to be and how religious people tend to be, in fact. And this is what he would say. I want you to see this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. He says, these people are going to be people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These people sound terrible, right? Or maybe does it sound familiar? Maybe you know people like this. But here's the kicker. What Paul tells Timothy is that these are people who hold to a form of godliness but deny its power. What he's saying is this. There are people in the pews on Sunday morning. There are people who put offerings in the offering plate on a weekly basis. There are people who click the heart button on the scripture verse that you posted on your Instagram profile who are very, very far from God. They have the outward appearance of holiness. They have holding to this form of godliness, yet on the inside, they are defiled. In fact, they are dead. I don't know if that's starting to sound familiar to you. Maybe it hits a little too close to home. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you're recognizing it in yourself. This is the undiluted reality, and it sounds harsh, but it's like the friend who's willing to tell you you're in a toxic relationship. Things are just not going to work out for you that way. God's desire, it goes so much deeper than religious activity. God's desire for you is to become holy from the inside out. 
And we're going to see how that happens in just a few moments. But for now, I want to shift to kind of the next undiluted reality in verse 15 through 19. So look at it with me here as we continue reading. It says, now, from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. And then God says, I struck you. All the works of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet produced. Now what Haggai is saying in these verses, three times you saw it repeated, is think carefully. It's essentially he's saying this, uh, if you would take serious inventory of life without God, if, if you would take serious inventory of a life that looks good on the outside but is dead on the inside, if you would think carefully about the results of that life, you know, you cannot deny it. It's just not going to work out for you. I mean, it's like a hamster wheel where you're not getting anywhere. You work harder, but you never quite arrive. This is the warning. Think carefully. Take serious inventory of a life without God. This is how it works. I mean, he points out two of the things that I think are huge temptations for us, by the way. We try to seek fulfillment in work and pleasure. Think about this. He says the grain, the yield of grain, doesn't, a match, the, doesn't match the amount of work. It's like they, they thought if they worked harder to provide for themselves that eventually they would get on top. Eventually they would have enough. Eventually they would be able uh, to be satisfied. But what happened was they always came up short. There was always a need for more. That's what happens. You recognize that. When you take serious inventory of life without God, you recognize work will never be enough to provide for my satisfaction. And then he talks about pleasure. He says, you thought if you pursued your own happiness, eventually you would find satisfaction. But the wine vat, it's not returning to you as much as you think you're getting. And wine's not bad in itself, right? I mean, but when you look to wine for satisfaction in life, there's never going to be enough wine in the world to provide for your happiness. This is the reality of it, right? In fact, here's what's happening. God says, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail. I ruined your crops, he would say earlier in chapter one. God keeps you from getting close to flourishing while he is at the bottom of your priority list because he can't bear to allow you to believe that sinful living can lead to true happiness. This is who God is. He's not being mean. He's being loving and just. He's being loving in that he's not going to allow sin to bring them satisfaction. And he's being just in that when, when people reject him outright, they reap what they sow. This is the way he set up the world to work. And these people had ignored God. They had rejected him. They had squandered his blessing. And Haggai was here as a good friend, prophet, truth teller to speak the hard truth into their life and say, if you take serious inventory of your life without God, you think about how you might be getting some things right on the outside but still dead on the inside, this is the result, right? You're never going to be fully satisfied. You'll never flourish without God. They were simply getting what they deserved. Why would Haggai harp on this? Like he did this in chapter one. He's gone back in chapter two. Like he just keeps beating this drum. Why would Haggai harp on this reality? It's for this reason. Those who are deeply aware of their sin are also deeply affected by God's grace. That's why. And it's at this point in verse 19 
that God's message through Haggai turns to God's gift of undeserved blessing. I mean, all of Haggai is building to this moment God's rebuke for prioritizing, prioritizing their comfort over his covenant. I mean, it was God's, the people's initial repentance, which, by the way, led to them working for four months just going through the motions without ever being spiritually changed. They thought if we just change our behavior, God will be happy. But really they learned now that God is after their heart. And until that happens, they're still defiled. They're spiritually dead. They're unacceptable to God. And it was at this moment, this point, this pivotal, crucial, climactic moment where the character of God shines the brightest. When the people sense they are at their worst. This is what verse 19 says. We didn't read the last sentence of verse 19 earlier. Let's read it now. It says, but from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, I will bless you. You see, living their own way, chasing after the Turkish delight of the world, the distractions of the world, would never lead them to satisfaction. It would ultimately lead to their destruction, but turning their hearts to the Lord is where God provided blessing. True human flourishing. Because this is who God is. This isn't just something he did for some people like 1,500 years ago. This is actually, uh, well, I guess I'm talking about from today, it would be, what, 3,500 years ago? This isn't just something God did that long ago. But it's something that recognizes, we recognize who God is. So almost 600 years after Haggai, was Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension. And then, uh, and then the church starts, and the mission and movement of Jesus is moving forward. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is spreading all over the known world. And the Apostle Paul is a missionary, and he's after, he's writing a lot of our New Testament. And when he gets to like the epicenter of culture, to Rome, he writes this letter to the Romans. And you know what he says to the Romans? He says in chapter 5, verse 8 of Romans, he says this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is who God is. That when we deserve it the least, God is the most generous to those who turn to him. This is God's grace. In fact, by definition, grace is God giving me what I don't deserve. And so how do we experience God's grace? What is the blessing that he brings to the people here in the story of Haggai? Well, there's two blessings, okay? I want to talk about how they fit in Haggai and what they mean to us. So let's keep reading. Verse 20 through 23, the undeserved blessing of God. It says this, The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. So the very same day, right? He says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'll overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of Gentile kingdoms. I'll overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of armies, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. This is the Lord's declaration. And make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. So how does it get from this undiluted reality of people who are just going through the motions, spiritually dead on the inside, to turning their hearts to the Lord and God promising blessing? Well, look at some of the things he says. And notice he uses this phrase in verse 21 for the second time in chapter 2. If you were here last week, you probably recognize it. And you go, wait, I thought we talked about that last week. Well, it's just there twice. He says, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, the first time he was referring to shaking treasure from the nations of the earth, from rival nations, to actually fund the temple project, to get it done. But now he goes a step further. And he says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. He says, I'm going to provide victory for Israel over their rival nations. So I'm not just going to get their money to fund the temple projects. not just how I'm going to provide for the finances of the project. He's like, I'm actually going to restore your political position in the world. I'm going to restore you as a nation. And this is so meaningful to these people because this is a people who had only known life being conquered. 
You ever go through a season of life where you just, things just aren't going your way? Where you go like, if, if one more thing goes wrong, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, right? Well, that's the people of Israel in this season of life. I mean, their parents, their parents' parents, they had been exiled. They had been removed from the promised land. It was as if all hope had been lost for God to fulfill his promises to and through his people. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know who they were supposed to be, how they were supposed to act. They had been captured by the Babylonians, taken to exile. And then the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And still the people of God are just sort of going like, what do we do? I mean, here we are. I mean, what's our place? Well, then God in his mercy restores them to the promised land, gives them this task of rebuilding the temple, yet still they're under the control and leadership and rule of foreign governments, even in their own land. But their ancestral history was full of stories of God bringing victory to his people. I mean, you can read about it all through the Old Testament. Whenever people had, the Israelite people had rivals, God won. God brought victory over and over and over again. But for quite a while, they just felt like defeated people. But in this promise, in this blessing, God is restoring hope. He's saying, who I have always been, I will continue to be. The promises I've made to you before will come to fruition. You may feel like things aren't going well, but I am still in charge. This is the promise he's making to them. And in fact, about 600 years later, after the church is born and after the gospel is spreading, the writer of the book of Hebrews in our New Testament quotes Haggai. I mean, this is cool. He he says this as in chapter 12, verses 26 through 29, he quotes Haggai saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken. That is, created things, so that what is not shaken might remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What's it saying to us? Haggai in Hebrews is saying that when we stand with God, We stand on a firm foundation. When God is our first priority and we find holiness through a relationship with him, we cannot be moved. We will not be shaken. We will endure. Ultimately, we will find satisfaction and fulfillment in that alone. Everything else that we might seek satisfaction in, it's going to get burned up, shaken, crumbled, destroyed. But God and his kingdom endures. So we stand on a firm foundation. We don't have to worry when our enemies are against us. And by the way, we have enemies. We have spiritual enemies. We have sometimes even political enemies. Doesn't it sound like in our world that sometimes people are just against Christians? Does it feel like to you that the world is just sort of like bowing up against faith in Jesus right now? Can I just tell you based on the scripture, don't worry. Don't fret about it because we stand on a firm foundation. We have a kingdom that is unshakable. And if we remain faithful to God, if we keep him first in our lives and we have holiness in our hearts from him, here's what will happen based on this prophetic word through Haggai, that we will actually see our enemies begin to fall. People who stand against the faith will actually turn against one another and ultimately God will conquer all enemies of his kingdom. This is the promise. This is the prophetic word. And if it's true, because the prophet's a truth teller, if it's true about then, it's true about now. And it's true for eternity. This is who God is and how he works. And so as he promises this blessing to overturn enemies, enemies turning against themselves, he also makes a second promise of undeserved blessing. And he speaks it directly to one man, this man Zerubbabel. Just practice saying that, right, Zerubbabel. Next time someone sneezes, say Zerubbabel. Uh, Just kidding. If you've been tracking through Haggai with us, by the way, you might notice this uh, as he makes this promise to Zerubbabel. Haggai has repeatedly referred to him as governor, even up through this portion of chapter 2. But now God calls him servant, his servant. There's a little shift. So Zerubbabel carries now a much bigger purpose 
than before. He's not just a governor. He's about God's purpose. His life carries huge purpose because God declares him to be like his signet ring. In other words, Zerubbabel will represent the authority of God to the nation of Israel. But not only that, Zerubbabel is going to represent even more than that. We'll get to there in just a minute. But, but this is the way that God is renewing, again, the hope in the covenant. The relationship that's been restored between him and his people. You know, 500 years before Haggai was the King David. And God made a covenant with King David that he would bring through David's lineage a savior king, a messiah, one who would conquer all of God's enemies for all time, who would usher in to this earth the kingdom of God and establish it forever and rule over all things. This was the promise that was made. And so now we see as he's restoring hope in this covenant, while all appeared to be lost in exile, now they've returned to the land. The covenant hope is being restored and God is anointing Zerubbabel, saying, you are, you're my chosen one. I've given you authority. I'm renewing hope in the Messiah. Guess where Zerubbabel's name shows up again in the Bible? It's about 400, 500 years after this, but it's just a few pages of a flip in the Bible, right? And it's into the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. It's the genealogy of Jesus. Zerubbabel's name is there. Do you see how God is fulfilling this blessing? How God is leading his people to restored hope and a relationship with him? Jesus fulfills the promise of undeserved blessing from Haggai. Jesus is the Savior King promised by God. Jesus is establishing the eternal reign of God over all the earth. And he started it in a unique way, not by conquering you know, nations and, and being a political leader, but by offering his life as a sacrifice for you and for me. Dying a sacrificial death, being raised again from the dead, conquering death once and for all. These are the weapons of, that God uses to establish his kingdom. He's restoring relationship with him. He's offering us new life in God's eternal kingdom through Jesus. And so we talk about, we got to be honest about the, the undiluted reality of our lives. That wow, sometimes we go through all these religious motions, but we feel spiritually dead inside. That means something. In fact, it, you ought to not push away from that. You ought to lean into that. Because that's the moment when you feel at your worst that God is most generous to you with his grace as you turn to him. That's the moment that you understand and appreciate his grace in a whole new way and experience the restored relationship with him that comes through faith in Jesus Christ who made a way for you to know God by his death and resurrection. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the offering of undeserved blessing to your life. And the moment you turn your heart to God through faith in Jesus Christ is the moment that God says to you, just like he said in verse 19 in this climactic moment of Haggai, he says, from this day forward, from this day on, I'll bless you. I'll provide happiness to you. I'm gonna help you understand human flourishing. I'm going to make you part of my kingdom. I'm going to make you, as even the Bible would continue to say in the New Testament, a co-heir with Christ. One who would actually share in ruling God's eternal kingdom. This is not just inviting you into a peasant relationship. God is adopting us through faith in Christ into his family and giving us his inheritance. So that we can have life that's full and that matters, not just now, but forever. This is the undeserved blessing that God offers, and he offers it to you today. His grace is available to you today, even when you're at your worst, even when you feel defiled, even when you don't feel anything on the inside. God's grace is there to meet you. Would you respond to Jesus in faith today? That is the call.